All right. Well, hello there, uh, Mrs. Erickson. Um, gonna, we're going to start a brand new chapter today, the last chapter for distance learning. Yay. Uh, chapter six is uh, mostly about habitats, niches, and species interactions. Um, it's titled Communities and Ecosystem Dynamics. So remember way back, I think it was in chapter four or chapter three, we talked about the levels of organization starting with an individual to a population, to a community, and a community is um, a bunch of different species living together in the same area. So we're going to take a look at this community interactions uh, and how it ties in with the ecosystem. So today I'm going to break up section 6.1 into two parts. This will be one part and this will also be one part. So we're looking at four lectures for this chapter. Habitats, niches or niches, depending on how you want to pronounce it, and species interactions. So today I'm going to talk about factors that describe habitats and niches. I'm going to pronounce it niches. Niches. I don't know. I'll, I'll probably go back <laughs> in between the two. Niches. Um, how they say it in Great Britain and I had a friend who was Canadian I know that's not Great Britain but she was a stickler for British pronunciations so uh, and then talk about um, yeah I'm pretty much just gonna cover this top part and tomorrow we'll talk about these tomorrow so what is a habitat a habitat by definition is all the biotic so biotic is living things as well as the abiotic, the non-living things um, or factors in an area where the organism lives. Specifically, a habitat describes where it lives. Okay. Now, I've discussed microhabitats or microclimates before, but microhabitats very similar. Many small organisms that live in a very small part of a larger habitat that we can see. So, like we have organisms that live under the bark of a rotting log that could be considered a microhabitat. We also have microbiomes, a micro microbial community, um, all the bacteria that's in an area, you know, and we can't see it with the naked eye, uh, but it's there. They're, they're, they're there. You have microbiomes in your mouth. You have microbiomes in your stomach and your small intestine. So your book has this diagram just showing, hey, look at all these different habitats. I mean, you got the tree, but then you could like really really zoom in and zoom in on the soil for a microbiome or underneath this rotting log here with the fungi and so on and so forth so I mean you actually have this cardinal could be considered a habitat or a microhabitat because it has a parasite a bird louse living on it. okay that's just disgusting I'm gonna move on okay um, a key vocab term here is tolerance um, basically what can an organism um, go through the different environmental conditions for it to survive and reproduce. And so we call that the tolerance. Um, it does have an optimal range, it does have zones of stress, and then um, their kind of survival rate tapers off on the very, very upper limits of tolerance or lower limits of tolerance. So like, you know, think of a plant. A plant has an optimal range, you know, it has, it has like this perfect amount of water, but if you have too much water, it does get stressed and if you really really have too much water you'll you'll just drown it whereas if you don't have any water okay it's stressed it starts to wilt but then eventually you know if it reaches that lower limit of tolerance the organism's gonna die so um, just know that organisms like us we do we also have a tolerance okay now a niche is the physical chemical and biological factors that a species needs to survive, stay healthy, and reproduce. Now, I know that's a really, really big definition, but the easiest way to remember a niche or a niche is how it lives in that habitat. So you could look at what kind of food does it consume? How does it compete for it? Where is it located in the food web? Is it in the upper trophic levels? Or is it a producer? Is it on the bottom? I mean, you know, so where it is food-wise. Um, you can also look at abiotic conditions. What's the air temperature? Does it need a specific amount of water? Behavior is also a big factor on how an organism lives in its environment. When is it active? Is it nocturnal or is it active during the day? Uh, when and where does it reproduce? Does it have like a special place that it, you know, spawns its offspring kind of like salmon in streams? Um, or does, is it very active during a certain part of the year? So I'm thinking like white-tailed deer and, and all that when they mate. 
Okay, competition. So organisms compete for resources, and this competition can occur within the same species, which is called intraspecific competition, or it can occur between members of different species. We call that interspecific competition. Now, one thing I want to bring up is a special case called competitive exclusion. When you have two species that compete for the same resources, one species will be better adapted to the environment. In other words, competitors that compete for the same resources in, in the same way cannot coexist. One's got to be better than the other, um, or one's, you know, sucks getting the resources that it needs. So it's going to, you know, become extinct. Its population is going to decrease. And so a great example of competitive exclusion is the red squirrel versus gray squirrel that's happening in Scotland and the UK right now, Great Britain. Um, so the red squirrel is native to Great Britain and the gray squirrel is American and it was brought over. Uh, so you can kind of think of it as maybe an invasive species. And this gray squirrels pretty much have the same habitat and niche. They compete for the same resources in the same way, but the grays are bigger and faster and stronger. And not only that, they bring with them a disease that they are pretty much immune to, that the, race, the red squirrels are not immune to. So they brought diseases over, um, kind of like a pox, if you will, or a herpes, I forget what kind of disease it is. And it wiped out the red squirrel population. And so Great Britain and Scotland have taken measures to eliminate or limit the gray squirrel um, population. So I do a short two YouTube, YouTube clips. Sorry, well, okay, this one's four minutes, and this one's another four minutes. I'm really sorry. Now, if YouTube trims these out, you know, you can um, look them up yourself, but this one is called Extinction Threat to Red Squirrel Competition GCSE Science Revision. So let's take a look. In East Anglia. <laughs> home to one of the last remaining populations of red squirrels in southern Britain. Except, I haven't seen a single one yet. So I'm off to meet Janie Steele for some squirrel spotting tips. It's her job to estimate how many squirrels actually live here. Red squirrels have lived in our woodlands for thousands of years. They were kept as pets, even eaten in centuries gone by, but their population has declined by 75% over the last 30 years. Hi, Janie. Hi Claire. I guess the problem with studying endangered species like the red squirrel is you don't get to see them very often. That's right, I can go weeks without seeing one. So why are they in decline? Well years ago the red squirrel was all over Britain. But about 100 years ago the grey squirrel was brought over from America and it competes with the red squirrel for resources such as food and habitat. And we've also faced with this disease problem as well. Uh, there's a disease called parapox virus which is fatal to the reds but it doesn't affect the greys. So what can you do to try and help things? Well my job is to study the red and grey squirrels in the natural habitat and also to try and increase the numbers of red squirrels that we've got here. How can you study them, Jamie, when you never see them? Well, if you come with me, I'll show you. Okay. Throughout the forest, Janie uses all sorts of different sampling techniques to try and get a picture of how many squirrels are living here and whether they're reds or greys. So this is a hair tube, just a normal piece of pipe attached to the tree. And we use these to survey an area for squirrels. We've um, got some food in the middle there, which serves to attract the squirrels, and some sticky tape at either end. So hopefully when they come along, they actually leave some hair. And you'll be able to tell. The sticky tape, yeah. Put this one up last week, so we'll have a look. See if any of them have been in the tube for a nibble of those nuts. Right. Uh, looks like a grey squirrel there. And that definitely looks like red. It's not always as easy as that to tell, but um, it certainly looks like red squirrel, which means they're around this area, which is great. Good news. Let's have a look see what else you've got. Okay. So this is a piece of the forest floor that I've raked. Uh, it's 50 metres long by a metre wide. And every so often I come along and look for the feeding remains of squirrels. Look, like here, we've got um, a pine cone that they've stripped and taken all the seeds out of. There's one with all the seeds still in it. Um, and what can you tell from this? We can get a rough idea of, of apart from where they're feeding, but how many animals are, are actually feeding in an area. Can you also tell if that's a red or a grey one that's that? Unfortunately not, no. Uh, it's a shame, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah, the only way we can tell which species it is is by trapping. And uh, 
I've got a lot of these traps up around the forest. There's a grey squirrel in here. I set this trap this morning. It looks like it's got a red face though. Yeah, a lot of people make mistakes uh, identifying greys as reds because of the, the colouring. They've got red on their face and the paws down the back too. So what would you do if it was a red? If it was a red squirrel, I'd uh, put one of these on a radio collar, sends out a signal and um, I can follow it all over the forest. And track it. We set out to find a red squirrel that Janie had tagged earlier. So Janie, this is how you track the red squirrels then? That's right, yep, we're just following the strongest signal and uh, we're certainly getting closer. It seems to be coming from that tree over there actually. Yep, I would say that it's up in that tree. So you can't see it, but you know it's there. That's right, yeah, that's the beauty of radio tracking. How many red squirrels do you reckon there are in the forest? Less than 50. The two main threats to red squirrels are competition for resources and disease. Here at Thetford, they're hoping to increase the number of reds by breeding them in captivity. But it's no good releasing them straight away whilst there's still the threat of disease. So Jane is hoping that a vaccine against the Parapox virus will be developed before she releases them back into the wild. All over the world, 11,000 species of plants and animals are facing a high risk of extinction. And that number is rising. In almost every case, it's because of the damage that people are doing to the environment. Okay, this one's a little bit cornier, uh, put on by a kid, British Wildlife Red Squirrels. Um, yeah, cut him some break, but he's, he's got some good information. Two natural world facts. I'm here in a woodland looking for one of Britain's most endangered mammals, the red squirrel. High quality iMovie. In England, it's hard to find red squirrels because grey squirrels, which were imported to Britain from America as they were fashionable in the late 1870s, brought with them the squirrel pox virus, a disease which is deadly to the native reds. Therefore, you will hardly ever see the red squirrels, but you're sure to see plenty of greys. So I've come here halfway across the channel to Jersey, where there are no grey squirrels at all, so it's the perfect place to find some reds. So we've set up this squirrel box with nuts in and we're going to take a look and see if any squirrels come to take any nuts. And we think this is a good spot. I've just spotted that at the top of this tall tree there's a squirrel nest which is called a dray which they make using twigs, leaves and moss and it's just up there. The red squirrel is the UK's only native species of squirrel and was once common across the UK, but now is listed as near threatened due to the introduction of the non-native grey squirrels from America. The greys carry a disease known as squirrel pox virus, which does not seem to have any effect on them, but can be deadly to the native reds. Red squirrels inhabit coniferous forests and deciduous woodlands in Scotland, Northumberland, Wales, Northern Ireland and the Lake District. They are most active in the mornings and late afternoons. Red squirrels are recognisable by their red to russet fur, ear tufts and long fluffy tails. The colour of their coat can vary with some reds appearing very grey, brown or even black. They have a white underside and grey squirrels are much stockier and rounder without any ear tufts. Red squirrels are very elusive and spend most of their time in the tree canopy. They often communicate with a squeaky vocalisation noise. Red squirrels have a mainly herbivorous diet that includes seeds, hazelnuts, green acorns, fungi, bark and sapwood. They also occasionally eat insects, young birds and birds' eggs. Reds do not hibernate and in autumn store fungi in trees to eat over the winter months when they are less active. When food is plentiful they put on weight in autumn to keep them warm over the winter. This is very important for breeding females for producing young in the spring. Red squirrels build large nests called drays high up in the forks of tree trunks and are usually solitary, only coming together to mate. 
In February to April, they produce two to three young called kittens, and often have a second litter from May to June. Outside of the mating season, red squirrels tend to live alone, but put on courtship displays called a mating chase through the trees in the spring. Thank you for watching Natural World Facts. See you next time. Okay. So, uh, if we were in class, I would have actually made you research a little bit more about the reds and the grays, and then we would have had a class debate where you would choose a side and just kind of debate all the facts and, you know, should, should we eliminate all the gray squirrels or, um, you know, let nature take its course. But, um, Gray squirrels, you know, since they are bigger, faster, stronger, and bring with them disease, they're basically like this, right? Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk about, I think, one more, two more things. Um, now, with competitive exclusion, it can usually result in two outcomes. I mean, well, I guess maybe three. Extinction, like population decline, basically. Um, but another outcome is called niche or niche partitioning where species naturally divide the resources based on competitive advantages. So all of these are species of warblers, but they're different species of warblers, and they all compete in the same tree. However, they compete um, or get their resources from different parts of the tree. So as a result, they can coexist together because they are utilized in different parts of the tree. So on your worksheet, I think you have to figure out which species it is by the information above. Um, and then just, uh, you know, there's a question that says, like, how can all these species coexist or something? That's because they're using different parts of the tree. Uh, so if the red squirrel, gray squirrels, like, if one of the squirrels only ate, like, the nuts off the ground and another got them from the trees, well, then they would have been able to coexist, but that's not the case. Red squirrels and gray squirrels um, compete for the same resources and the same trees at the same levels, etc. cetera. Um, so, yeah. But warblers, they're able to coexist because they do niche partitioning, which means they divide the resources. Another outcome in your book does not describe this is an evolutionary response where maybe a species undergoes something called divergent evolution. Um, I'm going to tell you a story about the dung beetles. So dung beetle males have horns, and some males don't have any horns at all, and some males have these extremely large horns, and they're bigger in size. And if you have large horns and are bigger in size, you can fight other males and compete for the right to mate with a female. And so if a um, dung beetle um, male with large horns and bigger in size, you know, fights a male, it, what it will do, and I'm just going to do my best to draw a picture here with my mouse. Okay, so it will gr like create a den. We're going to call it the love chamber. And um, the male and the female will get it on in the den. Okay, so there's the female, and there's the male, and they copulate. And then the big male will leave, and he'll stand guard on the outside while the sperm is, you know, doing its thing. Um, however, males, they don't have any horns, tend to be smaller in size. And so we tend to call them sneaky males. So while the big male is not looking, the sneaky male uh, can come in here and copulate with the female and uh, get a quick getaway dash because he's a lot faster than this big, strong, heavy male. Um, so there are advantages for both um, to be in a, sne a sneaky male or a big, strong male. Um, and, and you're probably wondering, well, wait, the, the male like already mated with her. Like, how does that work? Well, female insects... Most of them have like a, a, a sperm receptacle. And the reason why I know this is because this was like my key research in a college. Uh, I was kind of like obsessed with um, uh, this kind of behavior in, in insects. And females can kind of choose which males um, sperm they want to use. They have this like receptacle that stores sperm. Uh, some males, they have like spiny penises and can scrape out the former sperm and the female and, and inject its own and kind of get first dibs that way too. But the world of insects and um, copulation is actually really fascinating. So I'll just end it right there. Okay, so competitive exclusion. If a species is alone, it can thrive. So, sorry, I went, I went to the wrong line. Dash lines here. 
So there's two um, species of, oh my gosh, I can't think of what the P stands for, uh, paramecium, parame I think they're called paramecium's. Um, if they are alone, yeah, they're going to thrive. There's no competition. But when you throw them in together, and you can see this with the solid line, one might be better adapted um, than the other one. So in this case, the P. arilla uh, is, has a better adaption, thrives better than the P. caudatum. Okay, so it, this shows that they probably compete for the same resources in the same culture, etc. So the P. caudatum. In this case, it's kind of like the red squirrel, whereas the P. aurelia um, is kind of like the gray squirrel. All right, tomorrow I'm going to fit, uh, wrap up 6.1 and discuss keystone species and symbiosis. Sorry, this one was a little bit long, but at least you can get the first page um, done.